opportunity to worship you together. Thank you for the chance to get away from everything else and just focus on you, your love for us, your greatness, your goodness. And Lord, as we look into your word together today, I pray you'd just guide us and help us. Help us to hear you through all of this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are, where are we? Fourth Sunday in our series, Not a Fan. And basically what we're looking at is we're looking at the difference between being a fan of Jesus, who's really into what he does and likes him, and actually being a follower of Jesus who is committed to doing the things Jesus wants us to do and living for Christ as the center and focus of our lives. We, um, we had a, a tense few moments in our house about a week or so ago. I know those never happen in your house, I know. But we, we had a tense few moments. I was actually getting ready for bed, and uh, I put on one of the T-shirts I like to wear at night. And uh, I've had it for years, and, and, and I, I like it. It's Captain America. I thought that's quite, that's my alter ego, okay? I go to bed at night as Captain America. So, so I've had my Captain America, and I put on my Captain America shirt, and when I was wearing it as a t-shirt during the day, I'd, I'd cut the sleeves out to show my muscles. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 I put it, and, and Jill said, you know what? I'm going to throw that thing in the garbage. Really? She did. Just like that. No, would you like to, or maybe you should. Or here's a new one, but I'm throwing. And I said, no, no, you can't do that. She said, look, it's getting holes in it down the side. I said, no, you can't do it. This is the most comfortable thing that I've got to sleep in. Don't dare touch it. I'll let you know how that works out. But um, <laughs> no, it was like, you know, this is comfortable. I like it. I don't care if it's old. I don't care if it's tattered. I, I, I really don't. And uh, you know what? It's, it's, okay. it's, it's leave me alone. Uh, I've, told, uh, I, I've told you before, and a lot of you will know that, a, n a number of years ago I was offered an incredible bargain on buying a Mustang, a beautiful GT. And uh, so I got it, and I, I, I drove this Mustang around. And uh, like when I got it, it was like, wow, look at this, I got a Mustang. It's like it fitted my image, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, at last you got the car that really identifies with you. So I'm driving this Mustang, but at the same time, I kept my old Ford Expedition. Because the Mustang, you know, if the roads were slick at all, I wasn't going to risk taking the Mustang out on those roads. I like, but you know, within six months of getting the Mustang, it spent most of its life in a garage. And I used to jump into the Expedition because it was spacious, it was comfortable. Oh, and it was automatic too. And in the end of the day, I went for comfort. Which a lot of us do in so, you know, in so many aspects of our lives, we look to be comfortable. And there are a lot of people who are fans of Jesus, who are willing to commit to Jesus to a certain extent, so long as it doesn't take them out of their comfort zone. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is the uncomfortable cross. The uncomfortable cross cross because really to be a fully committed follower of Jesus at times is going to mean that our comfort comes second to actually our commitment to be followers of Jesus. Let's go back to one of the key verses of this series and just take a look at this for a moment. In Luke's gospel, Jesus says this, chapter 9 and verse 23, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. We've talked about the whole concept of being disciples. We've talked about the fact that the door, the invitation is open there to the whoever. But I want us now just to take a, a, a little time this morning to look at that bit that's really there in the middle that becomes that comes between whoever and follow me and Jesus said it's about denying yourself taking up their cross daily and following me 
Somebody told me a while ago that uh, someone had asked them what church they were a part of, and they said Genesis, and the response was, oh, isn't that where the guy always talks about grace? In a derogatory sense. And, and you know, yeah, I talk about grace a lot. You know why? Because actually that's the message of the Bible. Because Jesus talked about grace. Because the Bible talks about grace. That everything we've got comes to us through the grace and the mercy and the love of God. We don't have to earn God's favor. We don't have to be good enough for God. But God in His grace reaches down to us, reaches out to us, and puts, pours on us all the blessing of heaven. Of course, I talk a lot about grace. I wonder what they're talking about. But here's the thing. Some people seem to mistake that with preaching a message that doesn't make us think. With preaching a message that just helps us to be comfortable. And I guess if those folks who think we do that here at Genesis, they've never actually been here for long. Because I do everything I can to provoke every one of us to be the very best we can be for the God who has poured His grace upon us. Jesus said, if you can come after me, you've got to deny yourself. And the thing is this, self-denial is a countercultural thing nowadays. It's like even one of the ways people try to sell us stuff is like, drive the car you deserve. What did I do to deserve any kind of car? Take the vacation you've dreamed about and you deserve. You get to deserve vacations nowadays? How, how, how do you get to deserve? But it panders to that feeling in us like, yeah, I do, you know. I should do this for myself. They don't care if you can afford it or not. They'll tell you 96 months you can pay for it even though you can't afford it now. Self-denial is really not a part of our culture. Yet Jesus said this in Luke 9 and verse 24, the following verse. He said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Jesus is saying, here's what it's going to demand from you. What this is going to demand from you is actually your life, your desires, your plans will take secondary place, first of all, to what does Jesus want me to do? And everything we do in life will go through the filter of, is this what Christ wants me to do as one of his followers? That makes the cross uncomfortable. It's not necessarily easy going. The cross is uncomfortable because actually it demands everything. The cross of Christ, there was no halfway thing. It wasn't like Jesus was half crucified. The cross demanded that Jesus gave everything. And when Jesus said, if we're going to be his followers, then we need to deny ourselves and take up our cross. The fact is the cross requires total commitment. And it requires that we be absolutely focused as followers of Jesus. One of the, the, the great blessings of life is family, isn't it? And, uh, God has blessed us with family, with children, with grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Goodness knows. We've been incredibly blessed. And um, some of our grandchildren live in Texas. We don't get to see them so often. But one of the things I love whenever, whenever I see them is, is to see that we, you know, we've got a grandson, Benjamin, who's 17. And um, is to see like he is so like me. It's, it's so encouraging. Here's a picture, John, if you could put that up. You see? You see the family resemblance there? Right? You want me to? No. Um, ben is an athlete. He is absolutely, totally focused on athletic stuff. He plays football. And uh, they've just started their training for his varsity year of football. And as part of the preparation when they started the training, the coach decided who he was going to allocate the number one locker to. And the number one, one locker was going to go to the player who had showed the most commitment and 
dedication through the off season to his training and to his preparation and also it was going to be based on how they were doing academically with their grades so it came down to Ben and one other student so coach got all the players together and he said uh, so we're going to decide which of you is going to take the number one locker and here's how we're going to do it You're going to face one another on the floor and you're going to put yourself in a plank position. You know what that is? Some of you don't. Yeah, well, Google it. Um, so, so he said, what you're going to do is you were going to plank face to face and the one who can plank the longest gets the number one locker. And he said, just to make it interesting you're each going to have a 90 pounds weight on your backs. So he put a 90 pound weight on their back and they're down on the floor planking, looking at each other. And Ben said the other guy was like sneering at him and snarling at him and making faces at him. And Ben was down there absolutely stony faced. Just looked straight at him. And from what I gather, what happened after quite a while, the other kids, his face started to kind of get distorted as he was showing the absolute pain. And then, base, then Ben started screaming in his face, you're done, you finish. finished, give up, you can't do it. Until the kid collapsed on the floor. And Ben got his number one prize locker. But you don't do that by staying in bed till eight o'clock in the morning and rushing to your classes. You do that by showing absolute commitment day after day, month after. Can you get that picture off? Because I'm intimidated by it. Uh, <laughs> thanks. But, but, but you, 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 it demands an incredible amount of effort. And you know something? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, a real follower of Jesus is not somebody for whom it is a part-time occupation that they actually get into or connect with when works for them and when they've got nothing better to do the cross is uncomfortable because it demands everything here's what jesus said in matthew 7 verse 13 he said enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Jesus is saying here, if you really want to be my follower, and if you want to know what it is to receive eternal life, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take a completely different path. He didn't just say, I want you to believe certain things. He said, your life needs to go. Your life needs to go in a whole different path direction. He didn't say you've got to start going to church on Sunday. He said your life's got to go in a different direction, and it's not the direction that most of the world is traveling in. In Luke chapter 9, verse 57, it says this, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus said, you know, you better get this straight. I'll go wherever you want me to go, dear Lord. And Jesus says, okay, then let me just tell you, it won't be easy sometimes. Jesus didn't possess a home to live in. He had no place to call his own. But his mission came ahead of his comfort. And if we are followers of Jesus, there are times when our commitment to Jesus will come before our own comfort. It's a road of self-denial. In the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, chapter 12, it says this, the last and final word is this, fear God, do what he tells you. Now, there's a whole Sunday morning message for you in, in, in one sentence, isn't it? Fear God, do what he tells you. The cross is uncomfortable because it demands everything. It demands a commitment that actually is at times going to cost us. I remember talking to someone years ago. I was pastoring in Scotland, and there, there was a guy in our church there who wanted to get baptized. He must have been 40 years old. He wanted to get baptized, and he said, you know what? 
I can't get baptized because my parents had me baptized when I was young and they would see it as a huge disrespect. And he didn't get baptized for years. And I tried to encourage him and I said, look, you could put it this way when you're talking to your parents. And some of you might have been in this position and may be in that position today. But ultimately there came a day when we were doing baptisms and we baptized in the sea there and we were doing baptisms and as we always do here on our celebration Sundays for baptisms, when we baptized those, when you were getting baptized, I threw out an invitation, said, is anybody else? And there came the time when he actually came forward and said, I want to be baptized. But it didn't go down well at all with some of his family. But you know, following Jesus means at times we will be misunderstood and there's a price that we have to pay. The cross is uncomfortable. If we're not careful, we can just get too cozy and we can easily settle back from being followers of Christ to being fans. I love the fact that so many people are able to join us on a Sunday morning through Facebook Live or further in the week, later in the week, to actually be able to plug in and to to listen to the teaching here on a Sunday morning. On an average Sunday, somewhere like a thousand people actually view the teaching here. Actually, I'm 999 of those. I just keep watching it over and over again. No. There's a, there's, a, there's about a thousand people who do. And, and I love that. There are people in other countries that watch on a regular basis. Uh, there are people in, in other states right across the country. I know it works great for our own folks if they're sick and can't be here or if they're working and you can catch up with it later in the day. But I do want to tell you one of the biggest dangers of us doing Facebook Live is that we start getting a little bit comfortable in our following Jesus. Because truth is, if you could be here on a Sunday, but you know what it's easier to watch it today on TV or on the computer or whatever else it is you know what you're opting for the comfortable cross and it doesn't exist it doesn't exist our commitment to Jesus means that Jesus comes first and you know what that means one hour a week we get together and we actually worship Jesus and we hear what he wants to say to us and we make that a commitment the cross demands everything. It's uncomfortable. In May of this year, we have another missions team that will be going down to the Dominican Republic. Now, here's the deal. On average, it costs 1000 or $1,100, $1,200 for each person who goes on the trip, and everyone pays for themselves. You know what that means? Like, if I said to you today, I've got 1000 bucks here for you. Could you use it? You say, yeah, right. I could too. Try me. But what that means is folks are taking a thousand or twelve hundred dollars that they could use uh, somewhere else and they're saying, I'm going to use this to do what I think Jesus wants me to do. It's uncomfortable. They're taking a week of their vacation time from their work for this year to say, I'm going to use this to go and serve other people and serve Jesus by doing that. The cross becomes uncomfortable a lot of us. In John 8 verse 29, Jesus said this, He said, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Look at this next. For I always do what pleases him. And for a follower of Jesus, our goal is, I always do what pleases him. Did you hear me say our goal is? Did you hear anything? Oh, okay. You heard me say our goal is, right? Yeah? Our goal is, because we don't always hit it. Is that right? We don't always get it right. But our goal is to always do what pleases Him. That is the goal of the follower. And sometimes it means doing what God wants us to do, even though immediately it might not seem in our best interest. But we put God first. And of course, the promise that God gives us is when we put Him first, He'll sort out everything else. And sometimes God's way may be something that seems like it's going to be painful for us. But we learn the lesson that we live by the book and we do what God wants us to do. The cross was very uncomfortable for Jesus. 
The night before he was crucified, he was praying. And here was his prayer, Luke 22, 42. He said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Father, I'd rather not do this. But I'm going to do what you want me to do. Followers of Jesus carry their cross daily. And that cross means at times we say, Lord, I'd rather not. But if this is what you want me to do, I'm going to do it. The cross is uncomfortable because it demands everything. Then the cross is uncomfortable because it looks weak. It looks weak. There are a lot of people who think following Jesus is a weak thing to do. I, our, uh, a lot of our teenagers and, and those who work with them are, are actually here to stay in this building now since they arrived this morning. And they're going to be staying until after 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And they are participating in a nationwide project that's offered to youth groups called the 30-Hour Famine. And it's, it's put together by World Vision, who are probably the most credible Christian organization, relief organization that there is, uh, bringing aid to people around the world. And everything that is raised goes to their mission and ministry of helping people that are starving. So our teens are not going to eat. In fact, they've been over an hour, right? They've been, they started 9 o'clock this morning. That's why there are a lot of donuts left in the cafe. They, they started in, no, that's why they came early to the cafe, right? So, so they started 9 o'clock this morning. They will finish at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. By the way, Domingo, our youth director, most of you know Domingo, right? He's, an, he's a terrific guy. He's got a huge heart. You know what he actually, he's got a huge beard too. Um, you know what he actually told the teens? He said, if you raise $2,500 through sponsorship, I will shave my beard off. He underestimated how much the teens love him. So here's what I'm going to tell you. $2,700 has already been raised. But here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to tell you. Why don't you make it really worthwhile for him and really bless our kids by going and meeting some of the teenagers just around that door in the corner when we finish today. And if you want to add your sponsorship to that, you know, heck, you know, don't let him shave off his beard for 2700 I mean, <laughs> if you can make that like four grand, that would be more worth it, wouldn't it? So if you want to do that, but encourage our kids. They are, they are doing this. It's a sacrifice on their parts, and they are, they're doing that to help children around the world that are hurting. So if you want to get behind them, and if you really want to see Domingo, I think it's in two weeks' time, he is going to look absolutely radical, different, and 50 years younger, then <laughs> go and help them. Let's get back to this, though. Get back to this. Okay, so it's a long weekend. It's a holiday weekend. So our teenagers are... are are going to be in here. Now, imagine going back to school on Tuesday, and you get on the bus, and some kids say, hey, so what do you do for the holiday? And, uh, and they say, oh, we did it. We had a great time. We, you know, we, we went out on Saturday night with all of our friends, and we stayed out real late, and we had a terrific time. And then, you know what? Since there's no school Monday, we had this incredible party on Sunday. It was fantastic. What did you do? Um, I stayed in church. I stayed in church for 30 hours. What'd you do? Um, ate nothing. <laughs> and they don't get it because it looks weak. But you know what's weak? What weak is going with the flow of the whole crowd. What's strong is saying, here's what I want to do in my life. And for 36 hours this weekend, here are 30 hours. What is it? 30. I better not lengthen it. For 30 hours this weekend, I want to try to make a difference in the life of somebody who's starving. That's not weak. That's not weak. But people out there don't get it. They don't get it. Because there's something inside all of us that, you know, we, we want to look good in other people's eyes. 
I mean, there's not a single item of designer clothes that is worth the price tag. Really, I mean, what makes a pair of shoes worth $500? I'll tell you what makes it worth $500. Somebody will pay it. I mean, that's it. And then you pay it and you wear them and it's like bragging rights, like I could afford these shoes. Of course, they didn't see your credit card bill. Anyway, let's keep going. I could afford these shoes. But if everybody could afford those shoes, there wouldn't be any kind of status symbol anymore. Maybe the price would come down to what they were really worth and you'd pick them up for 20 bucks in calls. All of us want to look good. But the truth is this, to a lot of people, when we go the way of Jesus and carry the cross daily, it looks like we're weak. Hey, it looked like that in Jesus' day. The Bible says everybody who dies on a tree is crucified, is cursed. He died the most lowly, the most despised death, as well as the most agonizing one, that it would be possible for anyone to die. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, then what you've got to do is take up your cross daily. I know, you know, we tend to use that phrase about, you know, well, you know, get these terrible headaches, but we've all got our cross to bear. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about taking the cross of identification with Jesus. And identifying with Jesus will sometimes look weak in other people's eyes. It tells us this in Hebrews 11 about Moses. Moses was raised in, in, in the courts of the king, the palace of the Pharaoh. But there came a time when the Bible says he chose rather to share ill treatment with the people of God. His people were slaves in Egypt than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses came to a point where he said, this is not where I belong. This is not me. These are my people. And he chose rather to spend his time with the people who were looked down on and who were despised than to be with the palace crowd. In 1 Peter 4, it says this. You spent enough time in the past doing what unbelievers like to do. You were promiscuous, had sinful desires, got drunk, went to wild parties, and took part in the forbidden worship of false gods. And unbelievers insult you now because they are surprised that you no longer join them in the same excesses of wild living. People don't get it. Peter says, you know, your life, this was your life. Your life was getting drunk. Your life was wild parties. Your life was getting into all kinds of stuff. Your life was promiscuity. But people don't understand it now at all. They got no idea what's happening with you. And they even insult you because, you know, oh, yeah, you're a holy roller now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're better than I am. Yeah, you're too good for us. Because followers of Christ make the choice that even though it may not be the most popular thing to do, we try to walk a line that would please the God that we serve and the Christ that we love. The cross is uncomfortable because it looks weak. But then the, 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 the final thing I want to say is this. While the cross is uncomfortable because it demands everything, the cross is uncomfortable because it looks weak, the cross is unconquerable because it speaks hope. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, the message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way to salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully, as it turns out. 
He says, other people don't get this, but we know. And here this Sunday morning, you and I know that what the cross has done is the cross has become the means of our hope and the means of our salvation. God has turned around what nobody would have wanted, what Jesus even asked to be spared. God has taken away the, the shame of Calvary, and instead Calvary has become the place of the ultimate victory where Jesus overcame the power of sin, the power of death, the power of the hell and where God turned everything upside down and brought those who were dead back to life that's you and me the cross is unconquerable Paul says this in in first Corinthians 22 a few verses down he said the Jews they demand signs Greeks look for wisdom but we preach Christ crucified like He's saying here, here, you know, the Gentiles, the Jewish believers, they're, they're looking for something intellectual to convince them. Jews say, show us some miracles happening. He says, here's all we've got, but here's all we need. Jesus died for us. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross. The cross. The cross needs to be something that is very real to us. The cross needs to be something we are aware of. And I'm not saying you've got to wear a crucifix. I'm not saying we have to have crosses around the place. Several people have said to me actually over the years, I don't see any cross around here. And there isn't one. And I say this. The secret is to carry the cross in your heart, not to have it on a wall. Now, don't get me wrong. If you've got a cross somewhere on a wall and it helps you, I'm not saying that's it, but I'm saying this. It's not having the ornament around the place, however big it might be or how special it would be. It's living my life, taking up the cross and following Jesus. God took the cross, which was the symbol of, of defeat and he turned it around and only God could do that God took the cross that represented defeat and he turned it into a symbol of victory so that now whenever we look at the cross the cross reminds us Christ died for us but I want to tell you this the best crosses are the realistic crosses with no Jesus on them sorry if I just tr trod on somebody's toes but, you know, if you've got a cross with Jesus on, that was history, and it only lasted for a few hours. But the cross is empty, and the grave is empty, and the throne of God is occupied by Jesus today. God took a cross that represented defeat and turned it into a symbol of victory. He took a cross that represented guilt and he made it the symbol of God's grace to us. He took a cross that represented condemnation and he turned it into a symbol of our freedom. He took a cross that represented pain and suffering. He turned it into a symbol that gives the promise of healing and of hope. He took a cross that represented death and he turned it into a symbol of life. Because he died and he rose again. The Bible says because he lives, we live also. Amen. Only God could do that. The cross is unconquerable because it speaks hope. And let's, just, let's bring this right down to where you might be living right now. And life might be out for you this morning. If God could take the death of his son, the darkest moment in the history of mankind and turn it around. God can do that for you today. If God could do that for Jesus, God can do that for you. If God could do that in those circumstances, God can do that in your circumstances. If he could take, if he could take the, 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 the blackest moment ever and turn it into the promise of eternal dawn, then God can turn the shell of your life into something you never planned before. God can take your own messes. You know, you know one of the things I love about the Bible is, is the Bible shows us people as they really were. Like every character in the Bible, apart from Jesus, is flawed. But God used them. 
Abraham was old. Hey, that's not a flaw. That's a blessing. We'll forget that one. <laughs> Jacob was insecure. Leo was unattractive. Joseph was humiliated. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was proud. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair. Elijah was a depressive. Jonah was disobedient. Naomi was just an insignificant widow. John the Baptist was eccentric, to say the least. Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered. Martha worried a lot. Samaritan woman who came to Jesus had five failed marriages and was living with somebody. Zacchaeus was the most unpopular person in the city. Thomas, after following Jesus for three and a half years, still doubted everything he said. The apostle Paul had really bad health. And young Timothy, his follower, was a very timid young man. The Bible is a list of imperfect people who discovered in their weakness God was strong and God could turn it around. God can do for you what God did through the cross. He turned the negative into an unbelievable positive. The Bible is a list of spiritual champions, most of whom protested they were unsuitable for the task God gave them. But when they said they would follow, God made a huge difference. The cross is unconquerable because it speaks hope. There's a story about a 10-year-old boy who had lost his arm in a horrific car accident. And sometime later, he decided that he wanted to study judo. So he went to an instructor, and he, uh, he got the instructor, an old Japanese judo master, and he got him to start to train him. And the master spent months and months and months training him. And, and after he'd been training him for quite a while, the boy was getting nervous because he was only teaching him one move. And one day he summoned up the courage to say to, say to the judo master, um, when are we going to move on to something else? And he said, this is the only thing you need to know. He kept working on it and he went into his first tournament, and to his absolute unbelief, he won the thing very quickly. He continued doing really well. He came into the final round of that tournament against the champion, and the referee, looking at this one-armed boy, talked to his trainer and said, look, I don't really think this is a good match or a fair match. You should forfeit. He said, no, I'm not going to forfeit. So he puts the boy in against the champion. And within a very short while, he beat the champion. As they were driving away, he said to, to the, the teacher, he said, how did I do that with just my one move? And the teacher said, you have almost mastered the most difficult move in judo. And the only way anyone can counter it is to grab their opponent's left arm. <laughs> God can use you the way you are. God wants you the way you are. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It'll demand everything but in return you get everything so two questions as I finish today number one have you started out yet as a follower of Jesus or would today be a good day to move out of the stands and say you know what I don't want to be a spectator I want to commit my life to following Jesus second question is this were you once following but you've opted for comfortable. And is today a good day for you to say, Lord Jesus, whatever it takes, I want to live the way you want me to live. I want to be the way you want me to be. I will take up my cross and follow you. Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you today that you didn't opt for your own comfort. You didn't go the route that was best for you. But you loved us so much that you gave your life for us. And Lord, I pray you'd help us all to be men and women who live for you. Live for you. Not just church attenders. Not just folks with a belief in God. But help us to be those who live out our faith day by day, I pray you've never fully committed your life to Christ, I want to suggest you pray something like this right now. Lord, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving your life so that I could have eternal life. Lord, today I commit my heart, my life to you. Make me your child. Forgive me for my sin. Lord, I want to start on the path of being your follower. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, and if you really want to start being a follower of Jesus, let me finish. If you go through the barn doors to the front desk on the left, there's a little book there that they've got, and I'd like you to get that book and have a good look at that book. It's a simple little book that talks about starting the journey of life with Jesus. Bless you. Let's stand and let's sing this closing song with the band.